Thank you so much for the, for your kind introduction. It's always a pleasure to be part of Palim India's uh, faculty training program. Uh, I'm happy to see so many uh, faces who have joined in from various parts of the country uh, for this program. So I extend a warm welcome on my behalf as well to all of you, those of we have logged in. And uh, without much ado, let us start uh, today's session, which is uh, the first part of uh, communication, as Ripriya just mentioned. Uh, just give me a moment to start my um, PowerPoint. Sripriya, uh, can you see the... Uh, yes, sir. Perfect. Screen? We are good to go. All right. So uh, today we will be talking about some basics of communication skills. There are a lot of studies, uh, research which has gone into it. And this one very old, 1986, very old uh, study is uh, one of my favorites. It says that the best predictor for resolution of headache problems turned out to be the patient's perception that they had an opportunity to tell their story and discuss their concerns about the headache fully with their physician during the first visit. This goes on to uh, just confirm that the first impression is the best impression. So when you have a patient coming to you for the first time, and if you are able to give them uh, this satisfaction that they have been listened to, not only a lot of their problems are taken care of, uh, but at the same time, you are likely to have a very loyal clientele thereafter. So it is very important vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, our relationship with our patients and their families, how much of an effort we put in communication. A lot of medical errors are happening because of communication. We know the problems with look-alike, sound-alike medication and how we are communicating with our fellow medical professionals as well as with our patients and families, which results in a lot of medical errors. And most of these are completely preventable. As far as the doctor-patient relationship is concerned, it is multidimensional. A good communication will lead you to better diagnostic accuracy we all know that good we all have been taught how important a history taking is but the history taking is only as good as the person who is taking the history if we employ good communication skills we will be able to dig out more information more information means more power for you to arrive at a more accurate diagnosis then about the patient's compliance with uh, your management. If you have given the best possible prescription, but if the patient does not take it, then you are unlikely to get the outcome that you are expecting out of it. Now the question is, why doesn't the patient take it? Does the patient trust you? Does the patient understand what has been prescribed and why it has been prescribed? Does the patient have any fear associated with any medicines or all of the medicines? Do they have any other socio-cultural issues which made them non-compliant? Until unless we don't understand that and plan accordingly, we are not likely to have a good clinical outcome. Even though you may have the best knowledge on the subject. Now, if the clinical outcome is good, if you're able to, you know, get your patient to comply with your management, naturally, you would expect good clinical outcome. With good clinical outcome comes a happy patient and a happy family. And if the patient is satisfied, you have a happy team. Just imagine if your patient and family are always being always criticizing, 
it will take down the morale of your team whereas if you have a happy smiling patient and family who are you know really uh, you know getting good benefit with our management you you can rest assured your team will also feel supercharged they will feel very positive they'll get a lot of energy to continue the good work that they are doing along with it comes the patient safety that we talked about a lot of medical errors can come down if we use effective communication and as a result litigations or as it often happens in our part of the country violence against the medical professionals can also come down i'm not saying good communication is the panacea for all kinds of violence against medical professionals but a fair bit of uh, violence against medical professionals can be brought down with better communication skills so what is the key to a good relationship communication and what is the key to good communication active listening so what exactly is active listening for our session today i have for ease of understanding i have divided active listening into body language and the verbal part of communication so today we will be learning about some positive body language as well as a few verbal do's and don'ts so why do we need to learn body language for one often when we talk to people we are usually not aware of how our body is communicating with people around us what is the tone of our voice what is the facial expression what are our hands doing where is our leg pointed all of these things have a bearing and because most of the time we are not aware of it we may be saying something but our body may be sending out some other signals which may not be satisfactory or it may be confusing to the person in front of you along with it the other reason why we should focus on body language is because the major part of any communication any communication it can be interpersonal communication it can be professional communication when two human beings are interacting with each other the major component of communication is non verbal that is the body language it can be our voice tone of our voice the body language all of these things constitute the major component of any communication this is also the reason why we should focus on body language <clears throat> if you are interested you can get more information on body language on google everything is available on google just type body language for doctors and you will get a lot of uh, material on it so for today uh, i'm just focusing on around 6 7 uh, points because uh, body language per se it's a vast area and obviously we can't cover it in our small session so just a few things which is going to help us uh, from the go uh, you can practice this in your day to day uh, professional lives there are plenty of other things to learn but today we are just focusing on this first and foremost eye contact often what happens is when the patient comes into your op or when you go to the patient's room in ip many a times you may be looking into the k sheet or nowadays uh, with emr looking on the computer screen so when people are first coming in contact with you for the day it's very to be on close the k sheet focus look away from the computer screen and look at the patient and others who have come along with it or when you have gone to see the patient in ip make eye contact eye contact is the starting point of any human relationship including professional relationship next important thing is smile smile gives a warmth to the relationship and smile is the best way 
to have a good relationship now in our times we have to wear mask all the time but please remember even if your face is covered the smile can be seen in your eyes and the smile can be heard in your voice so always smile now the thing is it is easier said than done it is easy for me to say smile but the problem is we human beings are programmed <clears throat> to smile only at those people we like or those people we know it could be our friends close family members or relatives or generally people we know or like smiling does not come naturally when we are dealing with people we don't know or are not related or we don't have a, some kind of a social relationship there we have to practice professional smile professional smile is like any professional skill like uh, you were not born uh, knowing how to take a blood pressure uh, but somebody taught you then you practice now it is easy for you to take a blood pressure similarly professional smile does not come until and unless you practice it so where can you practice you can practice uh, in a safe environment and for us medical professional the safe environment is our hospital or uh, in medical institution wherever we are working and there we start practicing smiling from the time we enter the premises give a smile to the security person at the gate park and then you walk into the hospital smile at every of each and every one of the employees over there it could be the food uh, department the catering department the administrative department the ward boys ward girls cleaning ladies anybody anybody and everybody so you may have to initially make a cognitive effort to remember and do it because as i said it does not come naturally professional smile but the more you practice it will become a spinal reflex you see anybody and a smile will come at your face but this will come only with practice it takes some effort but when you practice it will become a second nature you don't have to take an effort just like right now you don't have to take an effort when you want to check a blood pressure so professional smile will come only if you practice otherwise it will not come and as i said earlier if you practice professional smile then you will get a good tone of voice totally free you don't have to make any effort like you go to a supermarket you get uh, one item and you get other same another item free buy one get one free similarly if you practice professional smiling you will get a good tone of voice free 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 because you cannot have a bad tone with a smiling face with a smiling face a warm tone of voice will come you cannot have a smiling face and a grumpy sound for a grumpy <laughs> sound you have to have a grumpy face so with a grumpy face comes a grumpy sound with a smiling face comes a smiling sound that's what i said earlier when you smile your smile can be seen in your eyes and it can be heard in your voice so many a times a lot of problem starts not because of what we said but because of how we said so if you say it in a very warm nice way you are likely to have people liking you and if you say it in a very harsh indifferent cold manner is most probably people will not like you so the to assure good tone of voice practice professional smile another important area is body position how do you position yourself 
when you are interacting with your patient. Here you are seeing a medical professional standing by the bedside of a patient. And here you can see the patient is making eye contact with the, uh, and, the, uh, the and the medical professional is also making eye contact with the patient. The problem is because the medical professional is standing nearer to the head end of the patient, the patient has to turn the head at an acute angle and this will be uncomfortable. He's most likely to get a pain in the sternocleidomastoid over here. Whereas if this medical professional was standing nearer to the foot end, so this patient could have made eye contact more comfortably. So when you go to see a patient in the IP, start off the good morning, how are you, etc., etc. Start off by standing near the foot end of the patient. And once you need to examine, you can move closer and do your physical examination. But the starting point, a good place will be positioning yourself nearer to the foot end of the patient so that you both of you can have a comfortable eye contact. Remember, you can turn in your place, but the patient unfortunately is sitting or lying on the bed the patient's maneuverability would be uh, less compared to you. So for the patient's comfort, do this. And if possible, try to sit by the bedside of the patient nearer to the foot end. A good example is the picture on the top right side. Here you see a medical professional sitting by the bedside of the patient. You see position nearer to the foot end. So the patient can make eye contact with the medical professional in a more comfortable manner. And what is the advantage of sitting? When you sit down, you give more satisfaction to the patient and family. Just imagine if uh, your friends or uh, guests, relatives come to your house and they stand and spend their time. You give them tea, they drink the tea, but all standing. They never sit down. And after half an hour, they go. Will that be satisfying for you? Probably not, I am assuming. So it is very important that you sit down and don't spend extra time. Whatever is your normal time that you spend when you are with the patient, when you go for IP, it can be two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, that is up to you. But whatever time that is, try to sit down and interact. Of course, if you want to examine, you may have to get up and do that. But the talking part, the initial talking part, so try to sit down. It will enhance satisfaction. You lower your body position. It will enhance satisfaction. The same thing when you're dealing with children. Ch children, uh, because they are shorter in height than adults, we adults have a tendency to when we interact with them, we have a tendency to bend at our hips. And in the process, we end up looking down on them and they have to look up at us. So this creates this hierarchy. In communication, we try to avoid hierarchy. So we try to bring our body position to the eye level of the patient so that we can have eye level contact. Eye level contact should as much as it is equal, not from looking above to below, then the satisfaction will be more. So here is a medical professional who is bending at the knee so that eye contact is at level. If bending at the knee is too much of a problem, just pull up a chair and sit down and you will get the same effect. And you will be kinder on your knees as well. So body position, try to position yourself nearer to the foot end, at least at the beginning stage when you come into the room to interact with the patient and as much as possible, sit down, pull up a chair, pull up a stool, just sit down and have an interaction. Sitting down will increase satisfaction. The same thing applies to children. We don't, we, we, we love children, but we sometimes don't respect them enough and the respect should be shown in our body language another important thing to consider is body posture what we talked about earlier was body position now we are going to talk about body posture if you have a kaif a, a lardosis posture 
you will appear to be less satisfactory. If you have a kyphosis posture, you will appear to be more satisfactory because in a kyphosis posture, your body language is conveying the message, I am here to listen to you. And that is immensely satisfying to the person sitting in front of you. So this is a bit of a caricature, but remember if you are interacting with a person in front of you with your body going back into the chair, that means you are in lardosis. Remember and correct yourself, bring, your to, bring yourself to kyphosis. The, the way your spine is postured will determine the satisfaction or dissatisfaction. You can play with the mind of the person sitting in front of you with your spine. So definitely it is something to be considered. So here are a few examples of medical professionals leaning forward and having a conversation. Another important thing to consider is body space. We all have body spaces around us. We have an intimate space. <coughs> Excuse me. We have a social space and we have a public space. Intimate space, we allow only those people with whom we are intimate into our intimate space. Others, we don't willingly allow. But if we are in a public space, let's say a lift or a public transport, we have people whom we don't know or not at least intimate with standing very close to us. And this creates a bit of a discomfort an emotional distress, if I may put it that way. So the same thing happens to the patients when we as medical professionals have to invade their intimate space. It could be something like touching them uh, to check blood pressure or even more intimate things like doing a parietal examination or any intervention. So the point is, you may say, but there is an implied consent to it. After all, they came to me. They walked into the hospital. They came for whatever purpose. They came to me. And I am not disputing that. Definitely, there is an implied consent. But the implied consent is a cognitive thing. It's a rational thing. The discomfort of being violated it's an emotional distress. So even though there is an implied consent, it can still cause distress to the patient. The distress may vary in degrees, but definitely it will not be comfortable for the patient when we violate their intimate space because that as part of a professional requirement. So how do we reduce the emotional distress? It is by respecting the body space. Now, what do I mean by that? Tell them you are going to touch them before you actually touch them. For example, if you want to auscultate, you tell them, I'm going to examine you. If you want to you know, put in a cannula, you say, I'm going to put in a cannula. Don't treat them like small children. There's a small pain, you know, the small needle. Don't talk like that. I'm, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to put in a needle. It might pain a little. You know, put it in a casual way, but tell them what you are going to do before you actually do it. And if you are going to do a procedure in which the patient is going to be awake, tell them, explain to them what the procedure is, what you're going to do in a language that they understand. Cut out the medical jargon. Explain to them. And after explaining, while you're doing it, keep up a running commentary. I'm going to clean the skin with uh, a solution called betadine. I'm doing that. You'll feel a little wet over here. Okay. Now I'm going to put a cloth on you. And now I'm going to give you a, a, a local anesthetic. Uh, and I'm going to push the needle in. Okay, I have pushed, I have given the medicine. I'm going to wait for 30 seconds. Then I will start the procedure. So this way you can, you know, keep up a running commentary while you're doing so that the patient knows minute to minute what is to be expected. 
and this way you enhance their satisfaction of their experience of interacting with you so when you have to violate somebody's body space forewarn them that this is what you're going to do so that they are mentally prepared for it you don't have to take a very very formal way of doing it you just tell them this is what you're going to do and that's about it but just tell them don't skip that part so here are uh, two examples on the left side you have a medical professional kind of you know in uh, getting into the personal space of this person in an intimidating manner you can see standing up position aggressively moving forward and see this patient trying to go back into the chair as much as possible you see the expression of the face this is clearly a situation where the personal space is being violated and this is this person is uncomfortable though the medical professional may not mean to cause this distress maybe just asking some questions but the body language is clearly showing uh, an aggressive body language and a distress associated with it and here is another example of how it can be done right all the things that we talked about right now right eye contact see eye contact and smile smile i assume the tone of voice will be good both parties the the palliative nurse and the patient uh, at home both sitting down body position both sitting down comfortable body posture slight kyphosis slight kyphosis see bending forward uh, it's not necessary that the whole spine has to be in kyphosis a slight kyphosis over here is good enough a little bending towards little bending towards slight kyphosis is there and see comfortable body space comfortable for both parties so the, this body language that you see in this picture this is what we are aiming at everything positive over here and last but not the least never forget the most powerful therapeutic tool available to you the touch the human touch of the physician this is the most powerful therapeutic tool that you can have and it is free it doesn't cost you or the patient anything and while you are doing all of it remember don't spend extra time whatever time you are already spending with the patient you incorporate eye contact smile good tone of voice body position body posture respecting body space and where appropriate the human touch and all of this nothing you will have no wastage of time you don't have to spend one second extra just because you are practicing good body language and the benefits will be immense the patient satisfaction the family satisfaction the you know the client loyalty towards you all of this is going to increase and when they all of this will enhance will help you gain their trust and all of this will have a positive spin off with wherever you want to take this patient to so hard work is good smart work is more important good communication skill is all about making the maximum out of your time energy and effort we don't have time to waste we don't have energy to waste so make the most work smart and get the maximum benefit that is what good communication is all about now coming to some verbal do's and don'ts uh, while i am what do you call um, doing this uh, presentation if any question comes into your mind please type and put it in the box and we will uh, take it up later so coming to some verbal do's and don'ts first and foremost don't ask leading questions your pain is better now isn't it 
your breathlessness is better now isn't it so when you ask a question in a leading tone remember you are this powerful doctor who has asking this patient even if the patient is coming from a, a fairly okay background an empowered background when you ask something like that it becomes very difficult for the patient to say no i am still not better when you ask like that therefore to get the honest answer to get the real answer ask open ended question how are you today it's as simple as that don't ask leading question ask open ended question i have a toothache i am suffering terribly this is the biggest catastrophic problem that has occurred to me and if you say don't worry it is such a small small problem i am not at all going to be satisfied with you i don't like you because you are minimizing my problem for me my toothache is the biggest problem for me right now so if you say it is a small problem i am going to be dissatisfied with you and if you say what you are you know making a hue and cry about your toothache you go to the pediatric ward of the cancer center and you will see what real suffering is i don't care when i am suffering from toothache i don't care who is suffering anywhere else in the world for me my problem is the only problem in the world therefore don't compare your patient's problem with somebody else having according to you a bigger problem that is not going to give any satisfaction to your patient in fact they will hate you for that so do not minimize do not compare remember for everybody their problem is the main problem and for their problem is the only problem in the world so acknowledge that you must be really suffering if you say a word like that i will appreciate it and if you tell me anybody in your position would be you know like this would be behaving like that don't worry we will you know do something about it so basically you are saying that i am making a song and dance about it you are saying i am not a fool anybody in my position would behave like that you are acknowledging and normalizing my emotional experience of my suffering so what you say also has a lot of impact so do not minimize acknowledge people suffering do not compare their problems with some other problem but normalize their emotional experience of the problem don't say your problem is normal what you are going through anybody in your position would feel the same will be behaving like that normalize my emotional experience of the suffering i'm going through don't give false hope i have cancer stage 4 advanced malignancy and you're saying oh it's just a small so don't worry everything will be all right you take this medicine and come back after two weeks because i will believe you and then when i don't get better then what happens to my trust in you so always give realistic hope never give false hope <clears throat> realistic hope is something that you can actually do and you are doing this uh, foundation course in palliative medicine and you will realize there's a lot of things that can be done which is not taught to us in our medical education the only thing that is taught to us is diagnostics and therapeutics that's all and a little bit of preventive medicine they don't teach us what do you do when the disease is incurable what do you do for people with chronic incurable medical conditions associated with a lot of suffering they don't teach us how do you provide comfort 
for terminally ill patients. They don't teach us how do you speak to these people. They don't teach us what is the, uh, you know, the ethical way of decision making when you find uh, yourself in a uh, dilemma situation. They don't teach any of it. They only teach us diagnostics and therapeutic and send us out into the world and say, so you practice medicine. So in this foundation course, I can assure you, you will learn a lot of things that can be done realistically. In my day-to-day -day practice, I often have to say to the patient and the family, see your disease is incurable and it has progressed a lot. So your treating doctor uh, has, uh, you know, you know, exhausted all possible things for you. However, there's a lot that can be done to keep you comfortable. I'll make sure that you do not suffer and you can come back to me any number of times. And you know what I hear in return? They, most of the time, I hear doctor, that is all that I wanted to hear. And other times they say, doctor, you have given us so much of hope. So please remember, you do not give false hopes and then hope things will be all right. You have to be truthful at the same time, give realistic hope. And people really appreciate that and they will really stick with it. And I can vouch for it from my side and I can vouch for it from all the palliative practitioners all over the world. This is what they hear. When they tell their truth and give them realistic hope, people say that is all I ever wanted to hear. Or you have given us a lot of hope, doctor. So never shy away from giving realistic hope. Do not assume, for example, how is your breathlessness? Much better. So this uh, patient of interstitial lung disease, uh, you have given some medication and the patient says much better. Then ask a question. Do you have satisfactory relief? Probably the response may be not really. So remember, <laughs> You know, when we, uh, another analogy that I give is, you may reduce the blood sugar from 500 to 300, but is that satisfactory? No. So just because patients uh, say, I have relief, does not mean that they have satisfactory relief. So don't assume, ask. And then you will get the correct picture. If they say yes to this question of yours, then there is no confusion. So please do not assume. Uh, another, the uh, last part of today's uh, session would be, uh, you know, taking history. We all have been taught how to take history in our, uh, you know, education, uh, what do you call it, MBBS days. And we have been practicing history taking on a daily basis. So. In the context of the active listening skills that we have learned today, body language as well as uh, the verbal do's and don'ts, I'm just uh, you know giving you an example of history taking 2.0. Obviously, uh, that does not mean this is the only way you can take history. You will you know make modifications according to your requirement, but this is just uh, for a classroom session. History taking 2.0. First and foremost, greeting. And there are three components to it. Make eye contact, smile and nod your head and say something that is culturally appropriate wherever you practice. Second thing, get comfortable. That means if you are in your OPD and the patient family comes in, make them comfortable, offer them a seat. If you are going to see them, you become comfortable. You pull up a chair or a stool, sit down by the bedside of the patient. So you become comfortable and without any effort, you are enhancing their experience of you. The satisfaction will be enhanced. Start the interview with an open-ended question, which we just talked about. How, what can I do for you today? 
what brings you here how may i help you or tell me what happened anything just start with an open ended question and then listen do not interrupt there are plenty of studies which have shown that doctors interrupt their patients within the first 15 seconds of the patient starting to speak actual number is less than 15 seconds but i'm rounding off by saying within 15 seconds doctors interrupt once the patient start so do not interrupt listen and that is not enough you have to encourage your patient to talk so how do you encourage again simple maintain eye contact body language nod your head from time to time body language and make encouraging sounds or words mm -hmm. okay aha uh -huh. go on. so this way you will encourage your patient to talk if you just sit silently and stare at them they will get so nervous that they will not know whether they should continue or not so encourage them to talk why because the more information you have the more power you have and clarify as you go along if you did not understand stop them there and say what did you say i did not hear what did you say i did not understand or is this what you meant so clarify as you go along why because the right information gives you the right kind of power more information more power the right kind of information gives you the right kind of power ask about their insight what do they understand about their medical condition for example ask them what did the doctor there tell you often i am amazed that many a times the patient and family don't even know the name of the doctor who had referred the patient to me they don't even know the the area of work the specialty what kind of doctor that was hey remember market yourself tell the tell your patient and family your name and what kind of doctor you are you are the chest doctor you are the you know anesthesia doctor you are the cardiology whatever you, you who will market you except you so make some effort tell your patient who you are and what you do so that they will remember and they will go and tell others ah, that doctor there in that hospital is so and so specialist market yourself and so try to understand what they understand about their medical condition ask them what did the doctor tell you about the report what was there in the x ray what was there in the scan what was there in the report and with this you will understand that they may know a few things which is right correct there are a lot of area that they have no idea and plus they may be having a lot of misconception or wrong ideas about their medical condition so it is very important for us to understand what do they understand another area that we need to understand is what their concerns are what is it that they want from us as medical professions our focus will be on pathology and what are the differential diagnosis and what are the different modalities of management as medical professional that is what we have been taught and that is what we are interested in but from the patient's point of view is it going to cost a lot is it going to take a long time am i going to suffer am i going to be in pain will my pain go away you know there can be hundred and other things that is the concerns from their point of view many a times the dissatisfaction between the public and the medical profession happens because we are not looking at their concerns our only focus is on what concerns us diagnosis and management so ask them what are your worries what are your concerns what is your expectation what do you want from me what do you expect that we will that we should do for you and as palliative care profession we ask these questions on a daily basis so that it gives us clarity what is it that they are looking for and then we come to know that because they don't know the reality their expectations are way above what we can possibly do there's a reality expectation mismatch and many of the time friction dissatisfaction happens because the patient and family have unexpected 
uh, un, sorry, unrealistic expectation and nobody told them what the reality was. So one way of creating a conducive environment is to do some truth telling, bring their expectation to reality. And how do you do that? You just tell them what the reality is. The truth telling is a very, very important area. We will do it in the next session on communicating bad news. So I'm not going to talk about it further. So it is very important to ask what their concerns are. Then once you have information after your detailed history taking, series of investigation, et cetera, et cetera, then share that informa information honestly and in a language that they understand. Don't bring our medical Greek and Latin jargons into the conversation. It will sound that Greek, it will sound like Greek and Latin to them. They will be sitting in front of you nodding their head and uh, you know, and you will be under the assumption that they understood. And you will, you will think that the half an hour or 45 minutes that you, your precious half an hour that you spend in counseling the patient, you think you have done a great job, but they will go out and say, doctor said something i did not understand anything whatever the person said these people don't tell us anything so what is the value of your precious half an hour and the energy and effort you put in when at the end of the day the family the patient and family say they said something we did not understand they don't tell us anything <laughs> the value is zero your time energy effort it all boils down to zero if that is what the end result is. Therefore, it is very important to communicate in a language that people understand. Cut out the jargon. Keep it simple. Now, that is a difficult skill to master because medical things are complex and how to put it in a simple way is not easy. But it is doable. Some kind of mentorship is definitely required. It is really going to help if there is a mentor who is an expert in communication skills. So you see, hear, watch, and then emulate. Otherwise, you just have to practice, 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 and hopefully get it right. Discuss treatment option. Gone are the days when the high and mighty doctor says, my way or the highway. This is what I think it is. This is what should be done you take it. Now, we don't work like that. Even within the medical system, we work like teams. We have a medical board. We have a tumor board. That means we realize that one person cannot be the repository of all the medical wisdom and knowledge. So we talk to different uh, specialists in our area. We have a medical board or a tumor board and we talk to each other and arrive at Yes, sir. I think uh... so. What we need to practice is yes, we need to have a medical consensus. Plus, we also need to talk to the patient and family because they are the expert when it comes to their reality of their social, financial reality, their beliefs system, their fears and doubts. They are the experts as far as their reality is concerned. So we may have a medical consensus. Then you have the patient and family. We talk to them. This is what we think is the right option. But what do you think? And for example, this requires admission to the hospital. Are you okay with it? Don't just say, don't just write a signature uh, on a piece of paper, admit, and then tell the you know nurse, uh, admit them without even talking to the patient and family. This happens a lot. I, I personally know of a patient, a lady who was posted for mastectomy, but the patient was never told that she was posted for mastectomy. She, was, she had no idea that the uh, surgery was uh, due next day. And finally, late <laughs> pre-anesthetic checkup, time when she came to know she made a big hue and cry you can't blame the lady for doing that 
<laughs> right so that could have been an extreme situation but please have a discussion with the patient and family and then have a, a take a decision by consensus now this is a little bit of a work for us but the advantage is whatever decisions we took we all are equal participants and equal responsibilities for this the responsibility gets distributed among we the medical professionals and the patient and family so we all are together in it so that is a bit of an insurance for us together we try and another advantage is that sometimes the best treatment may not be the most practical treatment the best treatment would be something that can be realistically done and what can be realistically done depends on the patient and family also we can do maybe a procedure which is uh, you know possible medically possible as well as uh, technically we have everything with us but what if the patient can't afford it right so even though you may have the best solution if it is not practical the clinical outcome will be zero so we have to look at what is the most practical option for that we need to sit with the patient and family and discuss for that we have to listen to their beliefs fears problems constraint and a participatory decision making is what i was talking about confirm uh, at the end and before you close the interview i always ask is there anything else after all the discussion you know uh, especially when it comes to complex uh, medical conditions we as palliative care people are usually dealing with patients who are terminally ill or having lot of complex problems after all the long drawn out discussion last i always ask is there anything else that you want to ask and this brings a smile on your face it is like you have a sumptuous meal and the end you have a dessert something sweet it gives a total satisfaction it brings a smile on your face so that dessert is that last question is there anything else that you want to ask is there anything else that you want to say so the patient and family usually has a smile when they go from my room because i asked that last question or when i am going away from their room when i am taking an ip round make it a habit of asking in the end so you are giving them a you know sweet experience and that is how you should have parting with the patient and family either they go away from you or you are going away from them so that is the positive energy that we want to create in the end and whether you are discharging them from ip or they are going away in op always give them uh, this option to get back in touch with you that is called leaving the door open i am amazed when i go for home care and sometimes i have a patient who is getting little sick and then i tell them why don't you take this patient back to your doctor the primary treating doctor maybe some other doctor in some other hospital i may be seeing the patient as part of a palliative home care program so i tell them why don't you go and uh, you know go to the doctor the you are having so much of a problem and i say uh, when i say that they say but well, the doctor has asked us to come back after two weeks i said that was true that was the time when you were getting discharged the doctor said come after two weeks but right now you are in trouble so then they asked me can we go like that so from our medical point of view we may think i mean what kind of a stupid question is that isn't that common sense but for patients and families they don't know <laughs> that they can actually go and access healthcare system uh, before the stipulated time the doctor told us uh, two weeks doctor told us one month so i said so what right now you have a problem you should go now so you have to remember it is not common sense and even then common sense is not very common as medical professionals we have to tell them that in case you need to access us come early so now i have part of put it in my uh, op prescription in the bottom review in two weeks uh, report early if no relief report early and not only i put it in print i tell them and remember give them some contact number if you don't want to give your personal mobile number don't give and that is perfectly fine but give them some number something 
that they can contact the hospital number some way that you know makes them possible to access health care you, you you don't want to be disturbed uh, that's fine but give them some so that is what i meant by leaving the door open and the last part is greeting same three points make eye contact smile nod your head and say what is culturally appropriate in your area hood and so the last slide is uh, active listening creates an empathetic experience for the patient we talk about empathy empathy what is empathy our body language what we say how we say all of it shows the patient and family that here is a doctor who cares about them we all as doctors we all care about the patient and family we just don't know how to show it nobody taught us that it's not our fault medical education short changes they only taught us diagnostics they only taught us therapeutics nothing else so this is what you know when you practice all of it your patient and family says nice doctor and they will remember they will not remember how beautiful your hospital was or how many multi crore machinery or what was the length of the degrees behind your name but they will remember how you made them feel often that is the only thing they remember so practice body language remember the verbal do's and don'ts so i'll stop here thank you i'll be happy to answer any questions uh and uh, i will stop sharing the screen right now thank you so much sir for walking all of us through the nuances of communication many a times uh, throughout our extensive and intensive training we start assuming that we are entitled to communication uh, because of the prefix which we earn uh, after five and a half years of training so this was a this was a timely reminder uh, which which was required at some juncture of our practice um so we are open for questions right now if uh, anybody would like to raise their hand ask questions on the chat or even unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and ask thank you anish for the encouraging words <laughs> it uh, gives a lot of uh, spiritual energy thank you thank you thank you sanchi thank you sir so i you. had one doubt if yes, i may please. so i was uh, i will share a brief of my experience so uh, i was working in covid care when one of my uh, covid care nurses in working in my icu uh, became positive and uh, her husband came to stay with her when her condition worsened and she was shifted to icu even though we gave her remdesivir and everything she kept on worsening mm -hmm. so i was giving them the uh, i didn't want to disappoint them the husband was like very caring to the wife and the mm -hmm. wife as a nurse she knew that she is getting sick Mm -hmm. so i was giving them the positive talk like mm -hmm. you will get better don't worry just think positive and uh, uh like that so positive talk i was giving so the day she became rtpcr negative we shifted her to normal icu but she, she was still on niv it mm -hmm. was like uh, she had the longest stay like 45 days she was in covid icu mm -hmm. then uh, later on she was shifted to normal icu so when she was shifted to normal icu the intensivist there uh, kind of told them frankly that uh, it is very difficult for them to recover so the the immediate reaction was that the husband called me and said uh, sir you didn't tell us like this so i was uh, i told him that see my point of view may be different from that intensivist point of view so i didn't want you to become concerned too much and lose hope that's why i was telling you but there are problems there is five rules everything like that i was telling them so that kind of uh, communication from one doctor to another will really put you in some kind of soup so that <laughs> that experience kind of uh, made me feel like what we 
can do what can we do in such instances like another doctor may tell an entirely different uh, story from their point of view some doctors are very frank when they say that you are going to going to die like you will tell they'll tell the you are going to not going to recover like that they might tell but even some doctors uh, want to keep a, a positive point of view same like our hospital gastroenterologist always gives them a positive uh, Uh, hope to even the end stage liver disease patients he will tell that we will do whatever we can and uh, such things and we will have to break the bands to them and they will tell no that doctor didn't say like that he is going to leave for another five years why are you saying like this like that the communication is uh, sometimes uh, uh, different from different doctors so is there something we can do to like minimize the gap between the way the doctors communicate uh thank you dr anish that was a wonderful question and uh, the angst uh, of your personal experience came through and you have raised uh, uh, some pertinent points so uh, before i forget one you have raised about uh, interprofessional communication right that is very very important the second point is how do you convey a bad news in a in a humane way right so and plus uh, this question of uh, is there a way of conveying bad news is there a model uh, for example i'll come to that you said one doctor no matter what conveys uh, you know uh, something hopeful for uh, for every patient i am all for it because there is no hopeless situation as we in politics say there is no hope, hopeless situation because there may be limits to cure there is no limit to care there is no limit to providing comfort even if somebody is in the last stages of their life last days of their life there are plenty to do vis-a-vis -vis providing comfort so yes of course give hope second when we convey bad news we have to convey it in a humane way and in a way that ensures that the person who is listening to the bad news wants to listen to it you do not impose bad news on people who do not want to hear it for that you need to figure out whether the person in front of you wants to hear the bad news or not so it is you cannot go as uh, as a doctor go around saying it is my duty to tell bad news it is my duty to convey bad news after assessing whether the person wants to hear it or not but you may have to convey to somebody who is responsible so that is a different matter so that we will cover in the next session but very important thing the first point is our interaction with our fellow medical professionals our 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 uh, you know uh, our own people and that is something nowadays even when we have we have to refer uh, we just write it in the case sheet you know it doesn't take much to just take out the mobile from your phone and call up that person and ask do you have a minute the person may be busy on the other end do you have a minute another person says yes hey hey there is a patient i want you to have looked at could you see so and so is the problem you know 30 seconds you know it doesn't take much and uh, and also if you have seen a patient you convey this to the other concerned person see i saw this and this is what i have told them doesn't take much so it is important that uh, see the point is today you have the session you understand uh, somebody wrote it was enlightening thank you for that so once the spark has come in you that communication skill is important and you all are leaders in your areas you make an effort to see that everybody get trained in communication because communication cannot be your individual cross to bear it is a team sport everybody needs to be trained so that you know you are not burdened with the only person going to do good communication everybody in your institution all medical professional doctors nurses physiotherapists pharmacists um, dietitian anybody because anybody can make a mess of things right 
so down uh, i mean not down up to the security people because many a times how they behave can cause a lot of anger situation in your institution and probably as a doctor you may end up trying to solve somebody who is bursting in anger because somebody was uh, uncivil to them and probably somebody was trying to maintain discipline probably a security person rubbed the patient or family the wrong way and you ended up trying to solve the mess so it is important that everybody from the security person at the gate to the ceo of your institution everybody needs to get uh, trained in the basics of communication not everybody needs to get trained in communicating bad news because as doctors we all need to get trained in that so communication is a team sport that means you your colleagues everybody needs to be communicating with each other in my day to day practice i get a call from oncologist the uh, so and so patient needs to be seen i tell them i ask them what have you told them first thing because i need to know so that i don't make a mess uh, i don't create trouble for the uh, my dear oncologist uh, because until unless i don't know what he or she has said I, you know i i can't go and just talk anything loosely so i ask what have you told after i've seen and uh, you know i have made some suggestions or had a discussion with the patient or the family i call up the concerned doctor and say see i have uh, seen and this is what i said sometimes i may not call i may be busy i may send a voice call and whatsapp to the the idea is convey that's all and that is a, a small effort that we all need to make but uh, dr anish has brought in a very important point we focus on doctor patient relationship doctor doctor relationship is also very important thank you sir uh, for answering that question so elaborately um Hello. so uh, with your permission uh, we have a presentation uh, case presentation pending so the time is 6:10 we have around 20 minutes uh, there are uh, quite a few hands as well as uh, questions in the chats however shall we uh, look into those after the case presentation is that all right sir yeah sure, sure. i mean uh, you you know you you know best regarding uh, some format, of the yeah. points may come up for discussion during the case presentation itself so some of the questions may be answered yes please Sure. Vijay uh, sir, first of all, uh, I take the responsibility and um, I ask your pardon for not updating you that there was a case presentation today. Uh, the mixer came because of this I a new platform. I hope that you will forgive me. Uh, <laughs> Doctor Gregory, Doctor Arna, we do see your raised hands. We have a couple of comments also coming in. Definitely, we would take up those if time permits us. Uh, kindly bear with us for these inconveniences. Moving on to the case presentation in best interest of time. Dr. Jay sir. Yeah, I'm okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this time. Uh, thank you, sir, for this uh, wonderful presentation. I think uh, everybody should be listening to this uh, wonderful uh, PowerPoint. Um, I just uh, the reason I just want to present is though I'm a fan vision, so in a busy uh, OP, I missed a lot of uh, things skills which I supposed to do. So this patient is one such patient whom uh, was not able to communicate well and. Uh, so that's what i brought this thing for uh, your uh, as a presentation my patient is a 18 year old uh, gentleman uh, whose diagnosis was a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma of the right lung um um he's um, he came in uh, he came with a complaints of cough for one week and fever for two days um i gave i have given two dates the reason is the he presented on uh, 30th of august uh, 21 with a dry cough which was associated with throat pain um i th- sorry there was a history of fever for two days and he was a chronic smoker but a non known case of a hypertension or diabetes but if gives a history of aspiration like aspiration like episode during a dental procedure two weeks prior to this incident and also gives a history of allergic to uh, injection lignocaine um they then after four months he presented with hemoptysis for two days with frank bridge this is the uh, so when he came on the uh, so next slide when he came on august he was conscious his uh, vitals were stable um there was um, a chest we uh, could get uh, right basal cramps next slide 
So when he took an X-ray, it was showing a right Loisen consolidation on 30th of uh, uh, August. Hemoglobin was normal. Counts were in the normal side. Mutable slightly high. Um, so um, we uh, we treated as a Loisen pneumonia. But I but I just gave him a saying that uh, you need to uh, report. Okay. But uh, he was not willing. And uh, finally, when he had hemoptysis, he came for further investigations. That is four months later, we was having this uh, right low zone consolidation. The that time the CCT was showing us heterogeneously enhancing mass lesion with collapsed consolidated right low lobe with vascular and bronchial tumor thrombosis and also a metastatic mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Next slide. So coming to his psychosocial aspects, he's living alone. Uh, he was uh, he lost his wife earlier that year in March 21 for cancer. She was diagnosed in 2014 with a ovarian malignancy was was in treatment was in relapse and uh, died uh, in march 21 both the children are living abroad is very educated um, he said he's researching in electromagnetic field i went to his home he had a lot of equipments and then when he was when i was talking to him he talked about his experience of his uh, i don't know this uh, mystical experience i which i have not um, i have not uh, experienced or anything about his soul going out of his body and those kind of things which I was not able to understand. Okay, that was his psychosocial aspects. Next slide. And uh, when he came for the first time, we gave him antibiotics for his uh, right lows and consolidation. And then he presented lately after, uh, 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 okay, then uh, he came with hemoptysis. That time he gave a symptomatic treatment. Okay, next slide. So the main concern why I brought this thing was uh, there was a delay in doing uh, CT chest for nearly four months. He came in the month of August. That time, he was just having um, a, a basal consolidation, right lowest in consolidation, but there's no weight loss. There's no, uh, but so that that meant he was not uh, willing to accept uh, the things. So that was the thing. So I, I my thing is uh, that I'll come to the uh, um, thing later. So that was the main concern. The part was why there was a delay in doing. A, uh, for him to come for a CCT just after four months. Then denial of the diagnosis. Um, and then the third was difficult to make a decision. And that the other thing was not having a, a belief in allopathy or treatment. Though he, he used to bring his wife regularly for treatment, though we did not have family uh, uh, oncologist, we used to refer him to Coimbatore. For all small issues, he went in, uh, his wife went into hypoglycemia, Many times we were, I was treating him, uh, treating her, but his belief on allopathy was very less. Especially, he has this idea about um, allergic to lignocaine. So he brought everything. He he, he used to bring uh, send in reports of how lignocaine allergy can cause this. He'll send papers. He'll send uh, documents. That was the thing. Next slide. So summary to come: 18 year old gentleman living alone. Presented with cough and presented as low zone pneumonia at the end of August and was not willing to do CECT just till end of December until he had hemoptysis. It was confirmed to be a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Got admitted in the first week of February for hemoptysis. And uh, again on uh, 19th of February, with breathing difficulty and passed away on 26th of uh, February this year. Next slide. Um, yeah. So uh, this was my, uh, this is what I want to discuss. Why was he not willing to confirm the diagnosis? Because that was my first thing. The second is, was there a poor communication for the doctor? Said, Though we are, uh, we are very close, okay, in a sense, like uh, we had been here for four years and I know him for the past three years, uh, but still, but still I feel after uh, listening to the uh, uh, class, I think there was a definitely a poor communication from my side. And um, that was one thing. And then was there any barrier from the patient? Okay. And main thing is what I want to listen is, what does it, like there are four stages in communication here. Okay. Maybe the second, I think the breaking bad news will have it tomorrow. But at the time of presentation, what I should have done, okay, as a doctor. And the third is at the time of admission for symptom control. Okay, when he came with hemoptysis, what should be the way I should have communicated? And finally, at the time of admission for palliative care, um, to be frank, um, 
he is a very strong person okay so even uh, when he go, uh, at the uh, after this after january i had to we had a uh, whatsapp group with his sons i uh, so his both his children were in uh, both his uh, sons are in uh, abroad so i had to communicate them regularly but that communication it did not happen to the patient that's what i can say uh, there so that is my only thing this discussion point is what where did i go wrong so um, that's what things thank Anything you else you want? yeah so uh, in best interest of time maybe uh, we can ask uh, biju sir for his opinion and then move on to the discussion about the entire session as well biju sir your expert opinion <laughs> i guess uh, of course i will uh, you know uh, say what uh, i think but it's also important to uh, you know give a chance to sure uh, sir you know, <laughs> sure others sir. to you also chip in yeah so uh, now the discussion points are in front of the participants for your valuable inputs in fact a few uh, a few comments came in the whatsapp chat itself if you could uh, read the chat comments sure sir uh, these are uh, comments uh, which came in before the case presentations uh, started i believe and then we have uh, dr arnab saying idea concern expectations feelings and fears can be asked to the patient if time permits and situation asks for it and uh, okay dr arnab says uh, dr arnab has some queries dr arnab would you like to unmute and ask yourself or should i read it out yeah i'll i'll ask the question yeah so uh, uh, just listening to the case presentation uh, i was just thinking about these few questions that uh, uh, were you able to develop a doctor patient relationship before this pneumonia episode or was it after the pneumonia episode that you were trying to develop a relationship and trust with this patient because uh, uh, that the i just i'll just complete that question because uh, uh, patient being able to trust a doctor is very important to answer the first question of whether he is willing to Uh, hear about the diagnosis from you or not so just uh, can you just tell me about that yeah thing is uh, he, uh, even before uh, this diagnosis i was treating his uh, wife okay for uh, the uh, other problems she had ovarian malignancy and of late like before his, before her death uh, she used to have recurrent hypoglycemia so used to call in the middle of the night and then those things so our relationship was very good even before uh this diagnosis came of uh, pneumonia the thing is um, uh, my only thing is why didn't he take it very seriously is my thing like uh, being a smoker being very really educated uh, what did made him like wait for hemoptysis to develop to come for the thing that's what i, I tried telling him uh, tried documenting documenting documentation in the uh, chat telling that he reads this but he was he was very clear that no no it's better i'm fine uh, whether it is common with all the people denial of thing because he he knows uh, what has happened to his wife she lived for seven years but that is the thing but you are the relationship was very good so i i that was that was the reason i was uh, um, just find finding it difficult why he did not take my word why though he knows me very clear closely and that i take good interest of his family but why the he want he took his time to come for a check up hello okay, uh, hello hello hi good evening uh, may i speak um i think uh, gregory has already uh, started talking if you we could just take one at uh, one person at a time dr gregory please go ahead yeah thank you very much for the presentation so to me i think the reason why the patients never wanted to confirm 
the diagnosis is because he was already he has already made up his mind he has uh, he has got previous experience of what happened to the wife who also died of cancer he has been diagnosed of cancer of which he knows about it so any other diagnosis will really not make much of a difference rather than him making up his mind for whatever that might befall him so he probably thinks it's a waste of time, a waste of resources for him to really confirm the diagnosis. So he is educated enough to know where the disease might be leading him to. So um, the other point was the was there a poor communication from the side of the doctor? So like I would not want to say so for the relationship because. Because uh, you have stayed too long with the patient, so a kind of familiarity must have set in. So even apart from the patient-doctor relationship, there are certain things that might compromise the professional relationship because of the length of time you have spent with him. So I think that was the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gregory. Uh, Dr. Sanchia? Uh, yes, sir. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Dr. Jason, uh, regarding communication, since you are so familiar with the patient, I think uh, that um, there was no problem with rapo. I just think that he was in a, a stage of acceptance or denial. And every person is unique. So uh, they have their own thought process. I think uh, his thought process uh, was to wait before he was ready to approach you again. Because I think self-healing is a part of self-care. And uh, maybe it's not all about you improving your communication. Actually, these kind of courses help us uh, to develop that skill. But um, I feel that it was his own journey. So uh, he required that time because he has seen already somebody uh, close to him uh, lose it despite the best of care. So uh, continuing to smoke or uh, waiting for is, is their own kind of coping mechanism. What do you feel? Thank you, sir. Yeah, I think this, uh, my only thing is he kept on um, using this. I see even after when we went for diagnostic procedures lab, he'll say very clearly, don't put lignocaine. What kind of things? Like do, he has that, a clear thing of lignocaine allergy, which is, he says, is cause for everything. So, um, I would, that was, I don't know, I don't know how, that is why I'm asking when you have such kind of people who have some peculiar beliefs, how to, how to, how to communicate to them. That's why my only thing. So, uh, Arnab here. Yes. Sorry. Uh, sorry, please go ahead, sir. You know, Arna, I would rather hear you what you have to say. Okay, <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So uh, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Jason that this is a very common uh, uh, the problem. This is not just with lignocaine. Patients have problem with the entire allopathy itself. They say, I cannot take allopathic medicines. I, I Only herbal medicines are better for me. Only Ayurvedic is better for me. But they still come to us for an opinion. So I also... Uh, kind of uh, fall in that kind of difficult situation on what to tell them because all I know about is uh, allopathy and maybe a bit of herbal medicine, but I'm not an expert in herbal medicine. So actually, sir, I wanted to ask this question to you. So I'm just adding to the question. Yeah. So before you could answer, um, Dr. Anish, would you like to share your thoughts as well? Yeah. Um, I just uh, wanted to... Uh, say something out of my experience that uh, see uh, there is a, a saying in uh, Kerala that uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes sir we can hear you. Yes. So there is a saying in Kerala that uh, the uh, jasmine fl uh, plant in front of your house will not have a smell. So just like that if you, when, since you uh, when you go closer to the patient they think that you are a layman than a doctor. So if you are very close to the patient's family, they will tell uh, that we will get a second opinion. Shall we go and see that doctor? Such things like that happen. So like as my relatives used to say, 
to my uh, mother in law that why don't you go and see a doctor when i am sitting right next to her so uh, they lose that uh, uh, trust in you or like they don't consider you as a doctor so things like that are when you want to tell them that you should go and get a ct chest or uh, you should go and get a uh, ultrasound they'll say yeah okay fine i'll do that next year maybe or maybe somebody else uh, more professional should uh, come forward and tell so like that thing is there. that is one thing another thing is that and this uh, see the patient is here is 89 year old so these kind of patients even my father who was like 65 year old was uh, adamant that he doesn't want to take uh, medicines which uh, can produce side effects so he would rather uh, continue with his disease he was diagnosed of hepatitis cell or carcinoma actually so and he was like telling i will just go go on with the continue with the symptoms of the disease than to take an experimental medicine which might reduce my symptoms and give me a few more side effects so that kind of adamance is always there in some category of people who are mentally very bold so that kind of people are seen like you tell them that you're going to die they'll say yeah i already knew, knew that so it's not no not a big deal for me you just go ahead uh, do whatever you can like that they will tell us uh, so that kind of uh, or, or that uh, what do you say that uh, uh mental uh, status is seen i think uh, notice in this kind of patients in whatever you communicate with them they might not take it seriously this this kind of uh, uh, patients they will be stronger than you think you want to butter the news and they will take it without the butter they will throw away the butter and they'll have it so such kind of uh, uh, thing is there so another uh, thing is that this uh, short span uh, the patient came uh, only after worsening just like somebody told they want to live a comfortable life so it's like uh, one of my friend was having chest pain he went to the uh, ed took a ecg and saw the st elevation the doctor told that you are you are having mi and uh, we need to do an angioplasty so he said okay i'll just come in 15 minutes he just went out had a smoke and came back in so like that people are there so uh, some people are like uh, very uh, adamant and uh, sticking on to their beliefs and regarding the lignocaine part you can always tell them that yeah we will not give you lignocaine but we can uh, give a, a test dose of lignocaine make sure he doesn't have allergy and we can give him another substitute we can always give him a, a substitute for lignocaine a bupivacaine or uh, something else for that so even uh, sometimes when the patient want to sleep i used to give them distilled water and they'll sleep off i'll tell them that i've given you the medicine and they'll sleep off so like that we can have alternatives uh, to lignocaine as well even uh, psychological assessment we call it verbal anesthesia so thank you that was my uh, point of view thank you sir for that hilarious and bitter truth which is true in most of our lives or on all of our lives uh, we have almost uh, run out of time uh, biju sir uh, your comments thoughts and final first, remarks i would like to comment on dr anish anish you are developing a fan following fan following here <laughs> thank you for that <laughs> and because we are short of time i'm not elaborating on that i'll come straight to dr jason uh, jason uh, dr jason what exactly did you tell uh, your patient when the first time he came you knew he was a chronic smoker and there was a you know zone lung zone in the lung etc etc what exactly did you uh, tell him uh, you know what he should do yeah i told him that we'll give a course of antibiotic and after a course of antibiotic we'll repeat an x ray and see if it is not getting better we have to go for a for the investigation but uh, to be frank i didn't tell about malignancy at that time i didn't talk about cancer or i didn't talk about that maybe a cancer because he did not show that much uh, symptoms so i didn't talk about that so then when uh, after antibiotic the uh, did you follow him up did he come for follow up yeah he, he came for follow up uh, that time again the x ray was not completely resolved so that, that uh, so i very clearly told him that you have to but again uh, to be frank 
I didn't talk about malignancy. Didn't talk about cancer. Cancer was not told to him uh, till we get the uh, CCT done. So that was a till 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 we uh, got uh, December when he came with hemoptysis. Correct. Then when Correct. we did the CCT till that time, uh, it was not told in in, so, clear, in, clear, in his own medical term, in his own terms, in layman terms, we didn't tell. I so just, told that he's... just a question. So sorry to interrupt you for the shortage of time. If a similar case were to come now oh. and yeah. uh, same kind of a clinical history, uh, what how dif uh, what was the difference that you would bring in to your communication with the patient? Yeah, definitely, I think um, um, because I was not experienced in palliative for long uh, palliative with it, I will definitely uh, uh, ask him his ideas and concerns. Maybe like what is his what is his thoughts going about? What is his his thinking about? What is uh, what is that he thinks? What is the happening in his body? And then I can definitely I will if I have the doubt of malignancy, I will just put him a word that what I am thinking is malignancy, and I feel like it will be good for him because that it I is think good from to, his side, I good to go that. through good to check up right. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, Jason, why are you so hard on yourself, right? The first first time when this happened, you didn't know, yeah. right? Now you know, and now you will do a better job of it. So, don't be hard on yourself for uh, for things that you did not know. There are plenty of things that we don't know in our life, including our own speciality. So, don't be hard on yourself. So, you learn from your mistakes and you move on, right? It's uh, our the whole enterprise of healthcare is to learn from uh, you learn from your teachers you learn from your patients learn from your mistakes and then you move on we all make mistakes many of us make horrendous mistakes there is no shame in it the only shame is not learning from it and getting better so, so please don't be so hard on yourself the second thing is that Despite your best effort then and now and in future, there will be patients who will not listen to you. There will be patients for each one of us who will not listen to you. My question is, why should they listen to you? Just because you wear a death around your neck, you are not God incarnate. And it's not necessary that people will listen to God also. Right. The point is, the only thing in your hand is to convey to the best of your knowledge, to the best of your ability, convey to the person sitting in front of you, this could be the problem, this is the way to go about it according to me. If you have done that, you should go home and sleep with peace because you have done what is in your hands. Apart from that, nothing is in your hands. What the patient believes, whether the patient is in denial, lot of things or most of the things is not in your hand. The only thing that is in our hand as doctors is to get the knowledge, practice the skill and try our best to do the best for our patients. It is their choice whether they want to take our service. It is their choice if they want to listen to us. It is their choice. That is what autonomy is all about. Patients are allowed to make mistakes. Even if we know that it's a mistake, we tell them and they say, no, I'm not going to listen to you. That is their choice. That is each individual person's choice. And somebody mentioned denial. And it is perfectly, you know, normal to go into denial because it's a very, very powerful psychological shield when you are dealing, when I am I have to deal with a very, very terrible time uh, in my life, I go into denial. It is like uh, a shield to protect my sanity. And there are ways and means of going about it if there is a denial where uh, it is likely to be harmful to the person, then we 
may make an effort to break the denial you don't have to the point is even there the only thing in your hand is to make that effort if you have to the best of your knowledge you have made that effort then don't be hard on yourself no you do your karma don't wait for the karmaniya vadik pariste na mahafaleshu kadachana don't wait for the fall you just do your karma and leave it as long as you are clear in your head about that you should have a peaceful sleep every day there is no shame in failing the only shame is not in is in not trying right so you you have done to the best of your ability that time you did not know how to you know deal with this kind of situation now you learned and you very clearly said how you are going to do it i think that makes perfect sense so with that uh, i think i learned don't be i and i'll extend this to everybody all the medical professionals we go around with this such a big burden on ourselves that you know we did not do enough just do your part don't worry about things which is not under your control right if the stress that we take you know it shortens our life you all know that doctors are living less than the average population so you know that's all that i want to convey and we are short of time we are already past 10 minutes if there is anything else that somebody wants to add or uh, ask uh, i'll be happy to stay back for some more time but i'll stop here thank you sir thank you so much for uh, taking out so much time from your busy schedule we know that uh, this is just the beginning of the topic of communication we have just started peeling the different layers in it and in the next session we'll be going much uh, deeper into it uh, on uh, there were certain questions on uh, breaking some bad news or how to handle tense situations etc on the chat uh, but uh, i'm sure we'll be addressing that in the next uh, session yes we will yes um, so sir i think uh, if um, yeah i think uh, there is no more comments which is coming up no more hands which is raised for now so um, always our whatsapp group is open for uh, putting in your questions queries comments uh, for today uh, we shall be closing with that thank you so much sir for thank you thank so you time thank you again. all of you for such a wonderful discussion that we had thank you so much thank you dr biju uh, like I, i i have already started receiving personal messages that i need a uh, dr biju raghavan number so with your permission <laughs> i will be giving a whatsapp yes, number please. to some participants yes please <laughs> so and uh, today session i believe that there was a miscommunication from my end which i already told i couldn't communicate to you that there would be case presentation that's why no problem no problem uh, so uh, uh, this was really a in very interactive session to be honest uh i believe dr biju would also agree to me we, we have do, been seeing a lot of cohorts together and this was one of the most interactive sessions and uh, this will continue tomorrow with uh, as dr deepak said more focus on breaking bad news and handling pollutions so with that note this is shri priya along with dr biju raghavan and dr deepak sudhakaran signing off from the tips eco hub see you tomorrow again till then take care stay safe bye bye